It's my pleasure today to uh, introduce Siegfried Glenzer, uh, currently at Slack, as you can see from the, from the uh, slide. Siegfried got his PhD in Germany, uh, came to the US as a postdoc, uh, is that correct, to, to Livermore, uh, and he stayed there quite a few years. In fact, he um, wound up as the plasma physics group leader uh, involved with the NIF facility, the National Ignition Facility, uh, and worked there for uh, several years. And then in about a year ago, he went across the bay or across the bridge and um, joined Stanford. He's a member of the Stanford Institute for Materials and Energy Sciences, S-I-M-E-S. Um, and he works there, but it was heavily in, involved in LCLS's uh, programs, on, uh, and particularly the uh, Matter in Extreme Conditions, the MEC experiment. So Siegfried is a fellow of the American Physical Society, and in 2003 won a rather prestigious award, the John Dawson Award for Excellence in Plasma Physics Research, and it referenced his work in the diagnostics of complex plasmas that developed during these very uh, high-powered inertial confinement fusion experiments. So it's my pleasure today to uh, have uh, Dr. Glinzer here, and he's going to talk about uh, some of this exploring matter in extreme conditions. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, let me start by thanking Linda and the APS director to come out here to have the opportunity to present to you about matter in extreme conditions research at Stanford, and also to come down to APS on the floor to see the very impressive capabilities out here. So I'm talking about a new program that we're just starting, a new science program that takes full advantage of the LCLS free electron laser capabilities. That means we take advantage of the un unprecedented X-ray flux, namely 10 to the 12 X-ray photons, to perform pump probe experiments. We take advantage of very high spectral resolution. We use a seeded X-ray beam. We take advantage of good wave number resolution that can be performed with an X-ray laser. And we have very high temporal resolution of order 20 to 50 femtoseconds. And we just started this program, and we've already done a few firsts. So we have done some novel, novel X-ray scattering experiments. In particular, we have seen plasmons for the first time at LCS, and we've seen how the plasmons are shifting as they're compressing materials. We have performed the first continuous measurement of a dynamic structure factor at LCLS. I'll show you that, of course. And we have also measured for the first time ion acoustic waves in warm lens matter. And in phase space, we have approached pressures of order 10 megabar of three times compressed aluminum, and what we find is that the structure factor measurements that we are doing really performs um, a central function. They are very important to figure out collisions, entropy, pressure, in other words, to get the physical properties of matter in the extreme conditions. So with, just, with all this um, going, we have actually then started to, to look into new um, experiments, into new capabilities. And I will show you some data um, of um, work in progress. In particular, we have just begun studies of mixtures, material mixtures, of material strengths, and also of novel phase transitions. So and then I, at the end, I will conclude with, um, with a report on a high-power laser workshop that we have had uh, last October. And we really have a bright future in front of us because we have a new precision tool to measure physical properties and to make discoveries in high-energy density physics. So what are the big science questions? Of course. Um, this is also it's always driven by who funds us, but of course also driven by our curiosity as scientists. So what is really of interest to, to, to me and to us is um, the physics of relativistic laser plasma interactions. That means we're using high power lasers and we want to understand how are high power lasers interacting with materials and how, how do they heat the material, how is um, heat, the heat transported, and then particularly how, how can lasers be used to accelerate particles, namely to very high energies, electrons to GeV, electrons, protons to 100 MeV, and, and so on and so forth. Of course, we also are interested in making a connection in laboratory astrophysics. And again, high-power lasers play a critical role. We want to understand how we can produce and characterize collisional shocks and antimatter plasmas, in particular also, again, to understand particle acceleration by collisional shocks, and then uh, to explain the origin of cosmic rays. And last but not least, we um, are interested in strong shocks and high-pressure phenomena. This is actually the area that, where we could start right away at MVC and LCLS, because high-power lasers are up there. 
and functional to actually do shock compression experiments. And in particular, we want to probe the states, um, high pressure states that occur in the center of Jovian planets. And also in present inertia confinement fusion experiments that are going on at the National Ignition Facility. So down here, I show you a fusion target where you have a whole arm and you fire the laser beams into the, into the whole arm, you, you create X-rays, and the X-rays are used to implode fusion capsules. So fusion requires high temperatures. So what is going on in those experiments? You bring deuterium and tritium close to each other, the, 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 the fuse, you produce alpha particles and neutrons. The neutrons at 14.1 MeV get out, and you want the alpha particles to stay in and to heat your plasma and, and uh, to, to create a fusion wave. The way to do this, you first have to comp compress and heat a hotspot. Then, you, then the fusion processes are starting to set in. Then the alpha particles, if the, if the, if the hotspot is dense enough, will heat this hotspot further. And then you launch a burn wave around a dense fusion fuel material that surrounds the central hotspot. That's the idea of inertia confinement fusion. So uh, the way it works, you have a two millimeter pepper size corn um, target, fusion target in the center of the whole worm. You implode it, and actually 10 hours a second later, you complete to less than the diameter of a human hair. And those are real data. I mean, this is really what, what, is, what is occurring on, on in different implosion experiments right now. So in other words, you're creating a microscopic fusion plasma. And I told you those are real data, but it's still not enough yet to achieve a fusion burn wave. So of course, the idea, when, when it fully works, we will have an unlimited energy source. You can produce energy out of uh, heavy water. That means we all know this is the process that, that uh, fuels our sun. And in these, in these conditions, we have, to, we have to be aware that these are high pressure, high temperature conditions. So you all know from the from hydrogen molecule, you have a binding energy of roughly one megabar. But if you go to the center of Jupiter, you have roughly 80 megabar. And that's the, the pressure that is actually occurring on the outside of a fusion capsule implosion as you're compressing uh, the, the capsule. Then the central part of the hotspot needs to reach pressures above those that you find in the center of the sun, namely 300 gigabar. And when the, fully, when the plasma fully burns and you launch the burn wave, the pressures even exceed the, the, those that you found in the center of the sun. So this is matter in extreme conditions. This is the research that we are doing. And there have been actually some really good news lately out of NIF. So this is, this is a schematic of, an, of a fusion target. So there's, a, there's a central fusion capsule here. You can image the implosion down to 50, 30 micron uh, hotspot diameter. And what we recently found is that the total yield that comes out of a DT fusion capsule implosion is larger than the energy, namely the compression energy or compression yield that you put into the implosion. So I think I'm running out of battery on this. Let me just see if we can get another laser pointer. Very good. So, so what we found recently, or, or what was found first, is when you do low foot implosion, implosions, that means implosions that compress a lot, the yield is not very high. However, as you relax a little bit the compression, as you're compressing by a, roughly a factor of two less, so those are so-called high foot implosions, the yield is starting to take off. And now what we've, recently what we found, we found actually an, 22 kilojoule of yield out of a fusion capsule implosion. So this is just the onset of alpha heating. So now, of course, we have to understand the physics much better in order to, to push the limits further and to go fully into alpha heating regime and eventually launch a fusion burn wave. And what is the leading contender? Why, why, do, why do we run into problems? Um, people so far believe that Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities are the big problem and preventing us or preventing uh, NIF experiments from reaching ignition. What does this mean? This is a calculation done for Berlioz Mablader, done by Bruce Hamill. What he found is, um, when he, as he varies the conductivity 
in his um, hydrodynamic simulations, he finds that a fusion capsule can be either stable or can be unstable. On the left-hand side, you see how, how material of the outer, from the outer ablator is leaking into the DT. What this means is this is high Z material, or relatively high Z material compared to hydrogen. So you get this material into the hotspot, and it starts irradiating X-rays, and it cools the hotspots. It's quenching the fusion process. So understanding of connectivities by factors of three is important in order to design a stable or non-stable implosion. And of course, connectivities are not known in this regime by orders of magnitude. So for that reason, we now, do, we now have a new, um, new experimental capability to really understand matter in extreme conditions and to test the physics models that are important for ICF, for planetary physics, and for application of high-power lasers. So we are using the matter in extreme conditions end stations. This is a target chamber right here, which is a standard target chamber, which um, the same is also been used at Trident, at Los Alamos, and at Titan Laser in um, Livermore. And we have done, for the first experiment, we have, we have tracked shock waves in dense material. In um, th this, this case, was compressed aluminum. And we have succeeded with the first observation of plasmons in, um, in warm dense matter at LCLS. So this is LCLS, you know, it's a three kilometer long linear. You accelerate electrons to high energies. And LCLS right now uses only the last um, kilometer of the linear to accelerate, accelerate electrons to roughly 14 GeV. Then the electrons go through an analator here, producing the, um, the X-ray um, radiation due to um, self-amplified spontaneous emission or through seeding. I will explain that in a minute. And then we will, the X-rays get transferred to the near and far experimental halls, and the MEC end station is in the far experimental hall. So this is the schematic of the, of the MEC end station. The X-rays come through this pipe into the target chamber. Photon energies are between 800 and 8 kV. Um, typical pulses that we are using in our experiments of the order like 50 femtoseconds, and energies up to 4 millijoule on target. And um, we have uh, barium lenses to focus the beam onto the target, and what we find is we can essentially focus the X-ray beam to, to a diameter smaller than one micron. And that's very important because creating matter in extreme conditions is very difficult, so we have to use high-power lasers to do so. And this uh, small focus spot allows us to actually use joule-type lasers to heat micron-scale materials to a high temperature and high pressures, and now we can actually probe what's going on in our micron scale um, um, material. All right, so in order to do shock compression, we have, a, we have a laser system here. It's a long pulse laser, operates in the green. It's 527 nanometers, pulse width between 2 and 200 nanoseconds. And the repetition rate is like a shot every, every seven minutes. And the total energy is two times 15 joules on target. We also have a High power laser, that high power laser is of type sapphire laser, 35 femtoseconds, it can run at 10 hertz. But what we really want to do at, in, the, in the foreseeable future is to upgrade this capability. We've already uh, done the first step, upgrade to 25 terawatts, and very soon we want to go to 200 terawatts. And that will be a very unique pump probe capability at MEC. So this is the first experiment how, how we, um, that we have performed. We essentially have a high repetition rate target exchange where we put targets into, into a target holder and then we move the target around as we are uh, doing one shot every seven minutes. And we do those with the green laser beams. They roughly operate at intensities of 10 to the 14 watts per square centimeter. Those two beams are used to launch shock waves into the material. And then we use the LCS X-ray beam that is focused into the middle to do X-ray scattering. So we have spectral resolved X-ray scattering and wave number resolved X-ray scattering. And here in this experiment, we used an incident seeded beam with a narrow um, X-ray bandwidth. In backscatter, you see um, the elastic scattering here. There's also Compton scattering way out. It's not shown here because we want to zoom in. You see in four other scattering, the elastic scattering is the plasma one right away. And those, are, those are raw data that you take on the screen as you do the experiment. You also, in the wave number, you combine these, stu these studies with wave number resolved scattering, and here you see the Dubai share rings in aluminum. And as the shocks are being propagating through the material, the Dubai share rings disappear, and instead you see an I9 correlation peak, sometimes also called a liquid peak. 
And um, let's first talk about plus one. So if you use a SASA beam, self-amplified spontaneous emission, you have a very broad X-ray spectrum of order 50 EV. If you use that and you compare forward and backscatter, well, maybe one can guess that there's a plus one underneath here when, when you look at the blue curve as the red curve. However, when you use a seeded beam, it's obvious that the plus one is coming up. So how does seeding work? For the, most of you are experts, um, but just a reminder, you put a crystal after the first 15 nanolators into, into your beam line. The first 15 produce a SASA beam, self-amplified spontaneous emission, and then the crystal knocks out a very narrow bandwidth in the center of the broad SASA spectrum. So now what is happening is those, the, the, you have the two sidebands, they're beating with each other, as they're creating a trailing monochromatic seed power um, at this point. And, uh, this, and then the electrons go around the diamond crystal through the chicane, and they match up with the trailing uh, X-ray X -ray power. And you only amplify the monochromatic seed power to roughly 5 to 20 gigawatts that then goes onto our, into our MEC target chamber. And of course, that work has, has produced record peak brightness, and that was actually critically important in order to do the plus one measurements. And I, I guess the... By doing so, we have taken away the peak brightness record from Sakla, who just recently came up in Japan. All right, so let's talk about plasmons. What are plasmons? Plasmons are plasma oscillations, so lung, or lung wave oscillations. And of course, you can observe them in forward scatter. That means in forward scatter geometry, we have a small k vector, sometimes called q. And that means we are looking at very large spatial scales. Spatial scales larger than the Debye length or the screening length in our dense plasma. And then we can observe the electron lung oscillations. And um, so we have seen this before, but here for the first time we have, we have, we have actually used the plasmas to measure compression. Um, you can not only measure the, the, the oscillations of, of the electron cloud, you can also measure the oscillations of, 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 the, of the ions through an acoustic base. And we actually recently observed those as well. And um, let's just zoom in into this part. So this is a, this is a spectrum um, from ambient aluminum or uncompressed aluminum, just isochronically heated. And then we have a, um, a, a theoretical structure factor that we can fit to the experimental data. So first we look at the elastic scattering, which is the dash curve. It's primarily, primarily determined by, S, by the, by, by the uh, SII of K and omega. And, um, the atomic form factor and the screening functions. And then the inelastic scanning um, f um, spectrum is determined by the electron feature, in this case, our plus one, um, plus one scattering spectrum. And from the frequency shift, which we see of order 19 EV, we can derive the electron densities. And that's actually based on first principles. And in this case, we get 1.8, 10 to the 23 electrons per cubic centimeter, which is exactly what you expect for uncompressed aluminum. The error bars are quite nice. I'll show you. I'm going to verify this in a minute. Let's just change the scale. And then we look at the shock compressed aluminum. And shock compressed aluminum, aluminum, we observe that the plasma shifts further out because the density increases. And also, we observe that the elastic scattering increases. So in this case, we get an electron density of 5.4, 10 to the 23 electrons per cubic centimeter. And it's roughly 2.5 two, two to 3 times compressed aluminum. So, these are really accurate measurements. You know, if you change the density by just 10%, it's obvious that the plus one resonance shifts out too much or, or, or is, is not matching up with experimental data. And we see right away that error bars are of the order of 5% measuring the electron density in this way. And this is really based on first principles. The elastic scanning amplitude is also very sensitive, in this case to temperature. And in this case, we get 1.75 EV or just roughly 20,000 degrees Kelvin. So now it's a very sensitive measurement. However, it's a, it's a model dependent measurement. There's no first principle theory yet. But there's a little but behind for those sitting on your, on your left. You see that we believe we have a model that describes these conditions very well. And, this, and we validate this model with wave number resolve scattering. So before I go there, let's Let's also, let's, let me also explain to you the, the acoustic wave measurements. That was really a brute force. In that case, we, 
We actually also use the CDB, but then we have to, we have to have an, an additional monochromator using uh, two silicon crystal, crystals to get the, the, uh, um, the energy resolution down by another one to two orders of magnitude to five times 10 to minus six. And in that case, if you, if you use a, a di-silicon crystal, you could observe um, the ion acoustic peak you see on either side. And in this case, it's a high K limit. That means the, the frequency shift of the ion acoustic modes was also dependent on density. And what actually we find a density of, of, that was independently analyzed by a different group, namely in Oxford. They found seven gram per cc, which is exactly what we found with plasmons in Stanford. So this is a very nice agreement. So let's now look at temperature and, and let me explain to you why we believe we, are, we can measure temperature in this regime. So this is a simulation of the two shock waves as they propagate through our solid. And when we do X-ray scattering of that, we see the, 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 the Bayer rings and there's a one 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 diffraction peak, for example, in, in aluminum at t equals zero. And as the shocks are propagating, we measure a broad I9 correlation peak. Now, this is, this is wave number resolved scattering. So although there is no lattice anymore, the back equation still holds. So we don't have a 2D lattice spacing. Instead, we have an average distance between ions. So the energy of the X-ray laser is constant. That means if, as the density increases, oh, sorry, yeah, as, as the density increases, the 2D gets smaller. That means, that means uh, um, the scattering angle must go up. And indeed, when we look at the shock coalescence, you see that the, that, the, uh, that the angle jumps up. So this is, again, a very nice measurement of, of, uh, of mass density now. But we can also look into the, into the um, intensity versus angle plot. And now we can compare these with theory. We know our density very well from plasmons. So let's look what different theoretical approximations tell us. So we got. Um, over here on the right-hand side, I, I, I plot a few functions. This is a Coulomb potential, for example. And this is a screened um, potential, also called a Yukawa potential, where the screening cloud is, is, is screening the ionic charges. So now what happens is, as you compress material, the ions get closer and closer. This is aluminum. So you still have bound electron states. And what the bound electrons are doing, they're still orthogonal to everything else, so all, all the other wave functions in the system. That means they're actually weakening the screening cloud around the ions. And we call this, sometimes people call this negative screening, but it's essentially one can think of this as a short range repulsion. And now you get this green potential here, which is a, a, which is a, um, a Yukawa potential that includes short range repulsion. And as we include this, you get the red theoretical curve, which goes right through the data. Previous simulations or previous theories have used uh, screen one component plasma, which gives you um, the blue dash curve. And there's just no way that this curve can ever agree with experimental data. So now we believe we have a, we have a, um, a very good theory that describes the ionic potentials and that, that describes the, the elastic scattering amplitudes. So let's, have, let's do another check. Let's look at the, at the position, the peak position of um, of the ion correlation peak in, in angle. And um, so that here. So what we find is um, we, we have the peak, peak position and we have the compression from our plasmons. And again, we find that the, that the screened uh, Yukawa potential plus short range repulsion agrees very well with our, experiment, with our experiment. And that's why we believe we can get the, the ion temperature from our plasmon scattering spectrum. That was shown here. This is, um, this is again, our variation of plasma is 20%, and we have the theoretical approximation that lets us derive the temperature in this case. So not besides temperature, structural factors are generally important for von Lenz matter. So here we have to find these findings have important consequences to derive the physical properties of materials. In this case, we first we looked into pressure. So this, these are experimental data. This is the total pressure versus mass density. Those are the single shock Hugonia data from our experiment. And actually, they follow very nicely a previous empirical known curve published by Dave Young. And actually, also with DFT and D simulations, 
by Mazowitz. Those are particle simulations um, from 2008, and you see there's very good agreement for our single shock data. And the only reason why we can derive pressure now is because we, all of these quantities that go into pressure calculations are measured. In particular, the ion axis pressure is a central quantity. Namely, you see there's a, stru there's a structure factor in this equation, and that structure factor is measured. And that can account for as much as minus two megabar. And once we include this, we can derive the, the pressure from our data. So now let's look at the, at the data when the two shocks are, are colliding. Now what we find is that, the, that our experimental data follow um, or approach an isotherm. What that means is you can, as the shocks are coalescing, one can get to a higher density than in a single shock case. That means um, one needs less pressure to get, to get to like three times compressed aluminum. All right, so this is really nice. And actually what it, what it makes, it makes appetite for more. You know, you see this is three times compressed aluminum and now we have lots of theoretical predictions out there that actually tell you if you're compressing a little bit more, you see how the quantum mechanical effects due to ionization will affect the material properties. Namely, what is happening here between compressions and four and five, ionization starts to set in of the K-share electrons and um, the other um, 2P electrons. And what is happening is uh, the material pressure is, is directly being affected. So of course, this asks for a bigger laser to actually apply these techniques now to, to really solve these or, or to, to test these predictions. Um, that are out there now for more than two decades. All right, so let me, do, let me say a few more things. So we measure structure factors and I-9 correlation peaks. So a team of us, two postdocs, have gone out to uh, the Omega laser facility, which is a big laser in uh, upstate New York, and have attempted these types of measurements before. It was published for Temi Ma in PRL 2013. And actually what, what you see is a set of data of an ion ion correlation peak in aluminum. And to take this curve took us two years, two years and two postdocs. So now at SLS, we get this curve on one shot, and then we change the condition, we get the next shot. We get the next curve seven minutes later. So that's why this, this, this slide is two years versus seven minutes. So that's what the, the new enhanced capabilities get us. And of course, when you look at our SLS data, the, agree fairly well with conditions that are measured point by point from in previous studies. So now you have a capability out there where you can do a lot of things. And actually, we did so. So we started off with aluminum. We measured the correlation, ion correlation peak, and we just submitted this paper to Nature Materials. But we have also done measurements in magnesium, in carbon, and many other materials, because you can just do one shot every seven minutes. And uh, magnesium is very complex. We see a variety of phase transitions. Um, I don't want to get too much into this, but I have a few examples where we actually have made significant progress where I can give you some, um, to give you some examples of the experimental capabilities that is now out there that, where, um, that people can use. So, for example, mixtures. So we have done excess scattering, shock compressed boron nitride, and we directly can measure now the ionization in, in mixture of plasmas with wave number and spectral resolved excess scattering. We have measured novel phase transitions. So previous experiments um, have, um, have uh, conjectured there's a B1, B2 phase transitions in magnesium oxide. So what we believe is that some, for some high temperature regime, there's a B8 phase as well. And we can measure material strengths. Actually, what we have found, we can measure material strengths in diamond all the way to five megabar. So let's go through this. This is boron nitride. The red, again, is the experimental data. And what we've done here, we, we, look, we look at the at our theoretical calculations. And we fit this to the, to the, to the measurements. And what we find is for, for a mass density of 3.05 gram per cc, we get a very good understanding of where the peak lies in, in, in wave number. And you can see how accurate this measurement is. If you look at 2.8 or 3.2 gram per cc, there's just no way this will ever agree with the experiment. So from, from here, just from these measurements, um, the relative error is 2%. So it's a very accurate measurement of mass, mass density. Now we've also measured the plasmon. So the plasmon is the electron density. So you have mass density, electron density, so you can de derive ionization in shock compressed materials. And that's, of course, a new technique, and we are looking at particle simulation by, by CEA, who are performing the, 
uh, the simulation as we speak. So let's look at magnesium oxide. So we've done X-ray diffraction. So this is magnesium oxide. This is the, the B1 phase. So now we shock compress the material. You, you can see, the, first of all, the, the 220 or whatever you might think this is, is actually broadening out. But then what you see, you see a double peak and a new peak coming up. And this peak is actually growing in amplitude. And this peak is actually shifting further out. So what that means is, as you're compressing the material, the back peaks are shifting into theta, or in, 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 in angle. That means you can follow an, an equation of state curves, the 2D spacing versus pressure. And what we find is this, the splitting here is evidence that, um, that you go from a B1 phase actually to a B8 phase at high pressures and at high temperatures. So now we've asked our collab collaborators. Of course, this is a phase diagram as I was motivated by previous studies on magnesium oxide, a laser-driven driven experiment where people have say, said that there are um, a B1, B2 phase transitions roughly at about um, 4 megabar or 400 GPA. So now if we find if the temperatures are high enough, we may push it into this regime where there could be a B8 phase. So this is still a work in progress, but it's very encouraging. And actually the diffraction data will give us really nice evidence for the new material phases that occur as you shock compress uh, matter to high pressures and high temperatures. So another example is diamond. So this is the 111 diffraction peak. You shock compress diamond, and you see how the peak is moving further out, simply because the 2D the gets smaller. So now you, you can do a line out. You see how far it's moving. And what is happening is, first of all, you, you see as a function of time, you see how the, two, how, the two, um, uh, how the data show a certain compression. This, those are just the shock waves as they're propagating in the diamond. And at about one nanosecond, the shock waves are meeting. They're coalescing. And then the density jumps up. And you can actually see this in, your, in the 2D. The 2D jumps up further. And then the lattice is relaxing. So from, from this measurement, we actually know the shock velocity. We know that the two shocks have met after one nanosecond. So now we have the shock velocity, and we have the, we have the compression. So now we can look at the Hugonio relations, and that's how we actually get, we go from compression to pressure. And you see those data are roughly between 4 and 5 megabar. So we have the 111 diffraction peak, but we also have the 220 diffraction peak. So those are two different spatial directions. This is ax uniaxial compression. That means you compress with lasers from two, on two sides. And what you find is when you infer the lattice constant, you see that they are different. And they're different by of order of 0.1 angstrom. And what that means is that's a direct measure of material strength. Because now what you see is you, com you compress the lattice more in that dimension than in, in, in the, in the um, lateral dimensions. So what we do, we use a elastic constant from DFT. And we, we directly get the shear strength versus the material strain. And we measure a strength of 2 megabar at 5 megabar. And when you compare this to, to previous work in diamond Embed cell, where, where people have, have measured um, uh, strengths uh, before, we actually make very nice contact down here at the 2 megabar regime, but we can push it now all the way out to 5 megabar. So even at 5 megabar, there's just no, no indication that the diamond has lost its strength yet. So of course, this was not known until We've done these measurements, and of course, we, again, we would like to push this further, and we would like to find out at what point diamond will lose its strengths. All right, so is this work actually helping with ICF? So there are lots, lots of nice, interesting results that I've shown you, but how, how do we feed back? How do we make implosions better? So now it happens that we have actually measured electron density and electron temperature in some other shock compression experiments at Omega. And what we found are the red data points. So we found that we get densities of 10 to the 24 electrons per cubic centimeter in shock compressed CH at temperatures that are very, very, very small, like 5 to 10 eV. And when we looked at our radiation hydrodynamic simulations, we got the green area. So, there was the, so the, the simulations or the predictions of our hydro codes were nowhere close to the experimental data. So at that time, it happened to be that Justin Borg, Roger Falconi, and others they were doing experiments at LCLS, and they actually found that continuum lowering 
is an important um, or was an important um, component in explaining their data. So they have actually tested various continuum lowering models. What we have done, we have asked the author of Hydra, which is Marty Marinek, to include continuum lowering into his code. And then we applied the continuum lowering calculations to our shock compression data. And what we find is once we include continuum lowering, we got very good agreement with experimental data. So what you, what you see here is an example of how doing some fundamental science experiments to look at, at physical properties can help improving your radiation hydrodynamic capability. And with that, you can then go, now go ahead and design implosions that, which are based on better physics models and hopefully will, are closer to, to, um, to, to the realities and will let us design experiments, capture implosions that actually um, reach the ignition regime. All right, so with this, let me, let me switch gears a little bit and let me talk about the high power laser workshop that we had last October, October 1, 2. Um, and Roger, Stefan, and me, we were, we, we were hosting it. And the idea was, where do we go with MEC? Are we just doing shock compression to five megabar? And the answer is no. What we, what we want to do, we want to bring up a new uh, shop with laser capability, and we want to greatly enhance the physics program that is going on at MEC. So we had lots of sponsors um, that, that came out. We had um, support from DOE. We had um, um, over 140 scientists registered from 19 university groups, eight national laboratories, 11 US companies, and 18 international groups. So this is a photo. We just published the workshop report in synchrotron radiation use just actually last week. You can all download it. People came from all of these places in the United States, also from Europe and Asia. And, uh, and the, the, what the, the goal of the workshop was really what, are the best, what is the best science you can do at MEC? That means um, what, what, is, what are the important new directions? Where do we have to go? And how, how does MEC and LCS stay unique and at the forefront of, of, of contemporary science? So we had speakers in the various areas. First, we, we talked about um, the MEC instrument, some new results. And then we were, t then we were focusing on high power laser matter interactions and how that can help us enhancing our experimental capabilities. So, and here's, here, this plot should give you an idea. So present MEC experiments are, so far have done shock compression experiments or isochronically heated matter experiments. That means you're primarily at solid density around a gram per cc, and then maybe you compress it a little bit, maybe you let it release a little bit, but you're primarily here in, in density space. And in temperature range, if you heat material isochronically, you may reach 100 EV, and it's, um, it's also very small. So uh, or in, t in total, this is a very small range in density t temperature phase space. However, with a 200 terawatt laser, we now believe we can access all of this temperature and density shown here. That means we can study um, physics that is related to fast ignition or to, to high power laser coupling and, and uh, heat transport in ignition studies. We can produce energetic particles uh, that are potentially important for, for, to understand cosmic rays, and of course, astrophysics and QED. So how do we do this? Of course, um, we still want to, to measure physical properties of hot dense matter. That means X-ray Thompson scanning is one of our core capabilities, st uh, studying megawatt pressures and, and isochronic heating and phase transitions. However, coupling of high, high power lasers are important because they give us very, very interesting capabilities in terms of, part of energetic particles. That means we will be able to produce 100 plus MeV protons. We can produce positron and neutrons with our short post laser. And we can produce GeV type class electrons. On the other hand, in the laboratory astrophysics arena, we can now use short post lasers to study self organization in plasmas, to study vibrant instabilities, how collision shocks come about. And, how cosmic, and, and then study the origin of cosmic rays, or the physics processes that allow us to model cosmic rays. So let's talk about short post lasers first. So here's, how we, here's what happened. So people have, have of course, talked about multi-GV electron beams, vacuum magnetic fields, and um, electron X-ray interactions. And this is an, this is an important um, new capability. What is, what is shown here is as a result of a PIC simulation where a high-power short-post laser interacts with a, with, with a low-density gas. 
the laser beam is expelling the electrons out by the fundamental motive force. The electrons just go, go, uh, go out of this so-called bubble. And what is left are the protons or the, or, the, or the ions that are left behind. Then the electrons are coming around, and the laser is propagating this way, and now the electrons see the positive charges in front of it. And, that's how the, and now the electrons get, get accelerated this way. This process is called wake field acceleration and can produce high energy electrons. In addition to that, they can also produce nice X-rays. I'll talk about this in a minute. Laser produce protons. People have, have, um, have suggested to, to, to use the laser, high power laser interaction with solids to, um, to produce um, 100 MeV protons to actually heat matter isochorically. And this is, of course, very interesting for medical applications because at around 200 MeV, 300 MeV protons, people can now talk about two therapies. And another, a third area was neutron beam generation. Now lasers can produce up to two times 10 to the nine neutrons in a single shot. And of course, that's important for material science, for fusion chamber diagnostics. All right, so let's talk about Betatron. I told you, as the electrons are coming around in a wake field, they're seeing the positive charges. If they get injected here on axis, they just get accelerated forward. But that's mostly not the case. They mostly get injected off axis. And then they wiggle in the bubble as they get accelerated. And they're producing a Betatron emission spectrum, which is broadband. And we have actually just observed them in an experiment that is now published in PRL, where we fire the Sharpus laser into a gas cell. This is an interferometer, interferometer measurement, seeing how the laser is propagating. And you see the electrons coming out here, they're deflected by a magnetic field, and the X-rays are going straight forward. And the Betatron X-rays have a 10 milliradiant um, angular divergence, and they're very interesting for experiments. So let's look at this again. Nobody is up here, but Betatron X-rays, those are theoretical calculations, indicate that they can get quite bright fluences of order 10 to the 9, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 photons per shot if you have a high power laser operating. And of course, with that, we believe you can do high temperature, uh, sorry, high temperature resolution X ray pump, X ray probe experiments with complementary X ray spectrum. So you have a narrow band, X ray bandwidth spectrum from LCLS and a broad X ray um, source from Betatron radiation. And they're both of order 10 to, to 100 femtoseconds which lends itself nicely for X-ray pump, X-ray probe experiments. All right, final, one final uh, touch is on, on, um, on collisional shocks. So what people have suggested, fire sh a high-intensity short post laser on a, on a foam, for example. And what happens is now you have counter-streaming currents. That means the fast electrons from the laser interaction go forward, and you have a cold return current, current to balance, um, you know, to, have, to keep charge neutrality. So now what happens is, if you have counter-propagating currents, if a magnetic field is starting from noise, the electrons are being pushed towards the knots where the B field is zero. And now you look at the right-hand rule, and what's happening is the field gets enhanced. So a field that grows from noise gets to very large amplitudes. And that's called the vibrant stability. And that's been conjectured to play a role in astrophysical objects, like here on the right-hand right side, you see the supernova remnant. And one sees the shock waves here, on both, on both sides. And the shock wave in spatial extent is, of course, much, much smaller than the whole extent of the remnant, which is where the, um, where the mean free pass is of order 40 light years. So this shock wave is a collisional shock phenomenon. And now the question is, how, does, how is this linked to, the, to uh, cosmic rays? And um, here are 3D, uh, sorry, 2D pick simulations. And they actually show that as a laser is propagating into our target, you have hot electrons streaming out. And as the hot electrons are streaming out, a magnetic field is produced around the hot electron currents, around the, around the streamers. And those magnetic fields are then, are then coalescing and form a collision shock. And one of the applications for LCLS would be to measure or to image the shock waves and, and study the formation of collisional shocks and eventually to study the physics of particle acceleration by collisionless, by collisional shocks. All right, so, and 
is our laser powerful enough? So the first, the first upgrade that we are talking about right now, we're saying we're talking about a 200 terawatt capability. However, if you make the pulse a little longer, the peak power drops a little bit. But um, we believe that in these, if you if run the, our 200 terawatt laser in that configuration, we will be able to, to drive a viable instability, to see the streamers and see the early stages of collision shock formation. And down the road, if we, if we have a capability to bring a petawatt laser to a fourth generation light source, we will be able to measure a fully developed collision shocks and to, that can actually accelerate particles. And with this, I almost want to conclude, but I want, want to show you this slide. This slide is um, showing an idea to, to bring a petawatt laser to LCLS. And the way, one, one way to do it is to have a new, a new uh, building site directly above the MEC hatch. And then we funnel the, the petawatt laser down and into, into our hatch, and we can do experiments um, where the petawatt beam always meets the X-ray beam to do, to do pump probe experiments. And um, this is a very timely proposal because 10 petawatt laser plants are right now being, being pursued heavily in Europe. I think Europe is building five petawatt lasers altogether in the Czech Republic, in Romania, in France. And it's one under the name Eli or Apollon. There's also the high Bev end station at Hamburg at DAISY. Um, so at DAISY XF, FAL that combines a 200 terawatt laser with the X-ray beam there, but the 200 terawatt laser at Hamburg will run at 10 hertz, while ours will run a shot every seven minutes. So once they start running, they're going to do a lot of very interesting physics. And uh, what we believe, we would need a new building, uh, shielding and infrastructure for a petawatt laser. But we have already started the negotiation with the, with the directors. That means if we have a petawatt laser that shoots, say, one every few minutes, then whenever the petawatt laser shoots, LCLS will kick an X-ray beam to our experimental area that we can always do a petawatt shot and X-ray X -ray probing experiment. And we believe this will result in a much higher access to the facility, and we can probably increase the, the, the present access um, capability by factors of two, maybe even, maybe even quadruple the number of users at the end station. With this, I'd like to thank you for your time. I'd like to thank my collaborators. I want to point out there's a next high power laser workshop um, planned. The preliminary dates are October 7, 8, and you're all welcome to attend. With this, I'd like to thank you and take your questions. You, you showed a, a Hydra simulation and, and experimental results which didn't match with each other. So what was missing physics in the Hydra simulation that actually can explain that discrepancy? Right. So, uh, so the Hydra simulation that I showed you previously that, that were far off. Um, let's go the other way. There we go. So these simulations here um, do not include continuum lowering. And in that sense, they, don't, they are like orbital field simulations. And what that means is, as you're compressing materials, the, the, the wave functions start to overlap, and the, the higher orbits become free. And this, this, this process is called continuum lowering. So in this case, the ionization state of carbon is only two. That means you can only ionize, in these simulations, the prediction is you have only ionized two, two electrons or, you know, out, of, out of the six that are available in carbon. However, once you properly include how, how the wave functions or how the potentials overlap, you find that actually all the LH electrons are free. And the ionization state is indeed four. And that's why you roughly double, double the electron density. You go from Z, Z close to two to Z close to four. All right, so 
presently the timing is believed to be uh, of order 100 femtoseconds. And that's all because the, the exit pulse is, is, is also um, the, is all originating by the electron gun up front, and they're, they're co-timed. So it's you know, one laser to speak into another laser. So that, that, that can be done to 100 femtoseconds. Yeah, so the, que right. so the question is, can you, can you drive nonlinear scattering, like nonlinear Compton scattering, nonlinear plasma scattering? And of course, this, um, we have tried this actually before. So um, what people have done, they, there's actually one work to, to do nonlinear Compton scattering. Um, that was done by David Rees. Um, I don't think they have, they have fully explored a nonlinear regime yet. In our case, what we are doing, we are always we are measuring our plasmons um, in, uh, say, first on uncompressed material as a function of intensity and see if we, if we ever drive it nonlinearly. And actually, we, we believe that at the, at the best foci, when we go to like three microns, that's what we typically use in some experiments, then um, you see temperature effects, yes, but the density is not changed. So you have to, you have to be careful what foci you, you're using, yes. Yeah, on this uh, uh, slide that you have here, you have um, some data from the Omega X-ray laser, and you have some error bars associated with it for electron density and electron temperature. So if you repeated this experiment with LCLS, how would you expect those error bars to change? Uh, so that, that's a good question. So, um, so the density is 10 to the 24, and um, at LCLS, We've, we've reached five times 10 to the 23, so just at the lower end of this regime. So I, I don't think the present laser capabilities at, at MEC and LCLS can actually push all the way up to here. They get close, but um, say if, if you compare it with this data point, I think you can, the error bars get a factor of three smaller. Yeah, so the capabilities are much, I mean, the extra capabilities are much better at LCLS and at Omega. Yeah. 